Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. Today, we are in the Beyond the Numbers series, a Lipid Control webinar series, and this is session five of the six-part series. This one is specifically calling all women sex-specific factors for heart attack and stroke. Before we get started, I just want to introduce the three partnering organizations for the webinar series, um, Mended Hearts, whose mission is to inspire hope and improve the quality of life of her patients and their families through ongoing peer-to-peer -peer support, education, and advocacy. The National Lipid Association's mission is to enhance the practice of lipid management in clinical medicine. And the foundation of the NLA's mission is to improve the welfare of patients and families affected by cholesterol and triglyceride problems. And we're all three very excited to have you all here. This is our second webinar series. We did have one in 2020, and we found that we had much more education to share, so we had to do another one. Uh, before we begin, I just wanna let everyone know, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hopefully you can read this, um, because if you can't hear, check the audio button on your personal computer to assure the sound is on. Please type your questions into the Q&A box at any time during the presentation. Questions will be read and answered after the presentation. But as a note, the presenter will not be able to answer questions about you specifically or about a loved one as she is not your treating physician. And then finally, a um, PDF version of the slides as well as a recording of this presentation will be available on the Mended Hearts website following the event. So now I would love to introduce the speakers that we have today. Um, we have Dr. Rachel Bond. She is the System Director of Women's Heart Health at Dignity Health Arizona. And we also have Lee Parker, who is a patient representative, and we're so happy that she's here to share her story with us. I am Andrea Bayer, the Executive Director here at Mended Heart. And before we kick it off and get into the nuts and bolts, I just want to share a quick poll on what your knowledge of risk factors with women, um, sex-specific risk factors for women is. Do you know a lot about it, a little bit, or nothing at all? And then hopefully throughout the webinar, you learn and everybody says they're knowledgeable at the end of this hour. We're going to just take one more second and let some few more people get into the voting. All right, I'm going to show you what we've got. So we we see it, everybody thinks a lot of people think they're somewhat knowledgeable. We've got 24% that says they're not knowledgeable at all. So I think that that is going to be a great start. And Dr. Bond, I am going to turn this over to you. Thank you so much, Andrea. And thank you all for the opportunity. I, I will be talking today about the sex specific risk factors for heart attack, as well as stroke in women. And I do think it's such an important topic because we know that heart disease, particularly cardiovascular disease, remains to be the leading cause of death in the United States for not just men, but also women. Now, with that, I always like to kind of give an overview of what we're going to be talking about. And beyond focusing on the current state of heart disease in women, we're also going to be talking about the impact community and culture plays on that actual impact. We're also going to be talking about the challenges and the diagnosis and management of the sex specific risk factors for heart disease and stroke. And lastly, we're going to learn a few tools on how we could better adapt strategies and promote solutions to improve these outcomes that we're seeing. So to begin, I always like to start my talks for the most part with this graphic because I think it paints a really great picture of where we were and where we are now and possibly even where we're going when it comes to how aggressive we are in terms of managing cardiovascular disease. And before I delve into the graphic, I think it's important to actually define what cardiovascular disease is. So that implies that we have a condition, either it be a blockage or plaque, which is cholesterol, that builds up in one of the arteries throughout the body. It could be within 
the neck or the brain and lead to a stroke. It could be within the heart and lead to a blockage or per se a heart attack in worst case scenarios. But it could also be in the arteries in our extremities, particularly our lower extremities, which may lead to something called peripheral arterial disease. The way patients usually present with that is, is they feel pain or discomfort upon walking. And normally when they rest, that pain and discomfort goes away. So all of those terms are umbrellaed under this larger term called cardiovascular disease. And when we look at the statistics of cardiovascular disease, you actually could see men in blue, women in red, that before the mid 1980s, men were dying at a much higher rate from cardiovascular disease than their female counterparts. It really wasn't until 1984 where we began to see a steady decline in men in terms of the number of deaths, but actually an ongoing increase in women when it comes to the number of deaths. What happened in the mid 1980s? Well, to answer that question, we had advancements in medications a lot of cholesterol lowering medications began to be uh, released on the market. Beyond that, we also had advancements in management and procedures such as something called angioplasty, which is where we take a balloon and we open up a blockage in one of the arteries of the heart. And what we were noticing was is that those managements were being provided disproportionately to men and unfortunately not to their female counterparts. And it really wasn't until the year 2000 when somebody decided to say, we need to look into the why behind this. A reason why is because awareness, not only in the community was lacking, but also from a clinician perspective, it was lacking. And it really wasn't until 2000 that the American Heart Association actually created the Go Red for Women campaign. With that, the American Heart Association joined forces with the American College of Cardiology and other cardiovascular societies to think about specific guidelines on how best to treat women. And with those guidelines, we began to see a steady decline in the number of deaths from heart disease, as well as stroke, umbrella again under that term cardiovascular disease. But what are we now noticing in the later years that all these efforts that we've made are actually now going in the wrong direction. If you see the number of deaths are actually raising. And when you actually look specifically, we know that, as I mentioned before, that heart disease is the leading cause of death for women, again, for men, but absolutely for women. But the fact is, is that with that awareness, we know that the vast majority of the population still believes that breast cancer is their greatest threat. And to put it into perspective, where one in three, 31 women will die from breast cancer, one in three will die from cardiovascular disease. That implies that a woman is 10 times more likely to die of heart disease than breast cancer. It also implies that one female dies every 80 seconds from heart disease. So it's really important that we understand our risks to prevent this because it's such a preventable condition something preventable 80% of the time, which we'll be focusing in on later about how it can be preventable 80% of the time. Now, when we think about heart disease as well, it's important for us to look at patients, not just from a gender perspective, but also from an age perspective, and even more importantly, from a race and ethnicity perspective. And where we are doing a really good job in having a decline in the number of deaths from heart disease has a lot to do over the past four decades with those that are older age, those above the age of 65. Where we're not doing as great a job or where we're seeing very limited improvement are in our younger population, less than 55, especially women, especially black women overall. And this highlights the disparities that we're seeing. And I do think it's important for us to bring up these disparities because to date, uh, African-American women are having the highest rates of death at very young ages. And that implies that there's some reason behind that. Does it have to do with risk factors? Well, we know that when it comes to the African-American race in general, they have the lowest prevalence of what we would call ideal components of cardiovascular health. So less likely to have blood pressure control, less likely to lack the use of tobacco, less likely to have a healthy diet. And because of that, they have the highest prevalence of total cardiovascular disease and unfortunately the highest death rates. The fact is, is that when we actually hone in 
on where the greatest disparities we're seeing when it comes to cardiovascular disease, and more importantly, the risk factors that lead to cardiovascular disease, it's actually blood pressure. So hypertension or elevated blood pressure is a very common cause of not just heart disease, but also stroke. And it's also a common cause of death. And it's most notable in the African-American community where you can see on average, the number of deaths compared to um, non-Hispanic whites as well as Hispanics are almost actually more than double. And the fact is, is when we focus in on African-American women, we know that nearly half of black women over the age of 20 have some form of heart disease with the leading risk factor being elevated blood pressure or hypertension. And I think that's something that we all need to soak in because above the age of 20, which is such a young age, nearly half have some form of cardiovascular disease. So why is it that black women in general are the highest risk population, the most vulnerable population? And it's really important for us to not address, not only address that they are, but also focus in on the why. Well, when we think about women in general, we do know that when it comes to presentation to the hospital, presentation specifically for heart disease, where we're thinking we're having a heart attack, we know that women are less likely to receive appropriate guideline medical uh, medication, medications such as a baby aspirin, medications such as medicine to lower your cholesterol levels, as well as other medications. But beyond that, women usually are less likely to be referred for life-saving procedures, such as a coronary angiogram, where we're able to access the arteries and actually see if there's a blockage that's causing the symptoms that they're presenting with. But when we actually focus in on the group of people that are less likely to receive all of this, all the studies across the board show that the younger one, one is, particularly 35 to 54, and also the race and ethnic makeup that they are, particularly black women, they are the ones that are most vulnerable and less likely to get this. Beyond that, we know when it comes to discharge, overall, women are less likely to be sent home with these medications that we know are life-saving. They're also less likely to be referred to cardiac rehab. Cardiac rehab is one of the, I think, one of the more profound life-saving things that we know lead to decreased rehospitalizations, improve, improvement in death overall. And women are not only less likely referred, but they're also less likely to complete it. So there are some disparities that we need to focus in on in a broader scale. But beyond even um, somebody presenting with the signs or symptoms of a heart attack, we know that um, disparities are seen even in other forms of cardiovascular disease, such as heart failure management, um, even arrhythmias, such as atrial fibrillation, where you have an erratic movement of your heart, usually at the upper chamber of your heart. Atrial fibrillation is a very common arrhythmia. And we know that as we get older, it actually becomes even more common. We also know as we get older, our risk of complications from atrial fibrillation increase. And those risks usually include a stroke. Despite knowing that women are more prone than men to have that, they're less likely to be referred uh, for blood thinning medication to protect them or even be referred to a specialized cardiologist who focuses on removing the atrial fibrillation. We call them an electrophysiologist. Even beyond arrhythmias, we know when it comes to peripheral arterial disease, as I mentioned earlier, that's when you have any disease in the arteries, usually in the legs, and that can cause that pain or discomfort. Sometimes in extreme cases, it can cause lesions or ulcers that just don't heal up or go away. Women are less aggressively managed when it comes to peripheral arterial disease, and they're also less likely to be screened for it. The same is uh, we see with valvular heart disease, specifically focusing in on something called aortic stenosis, where you have a tightness in one of the valves of your heart, where women are less likely to be referred for any life-saving procedures. And if they are, it's usually at a delayed time when they actually are presenting with much more severe symptoms. And again, awareness is a part of this. And when we think about awareness, the American Heart Association actually did in 2019, I think a really pivotal research study because they saw that back in 2009, 65% of women in the United States actually knew that cardiovascular disease was their leading cause or their leading threat. 
when they actually looked at this in 2019, that dropped to only 44% of the population. And when they saw and surveyed who had the greatest lack of awareness, again, it was that younger population, especially women of color, those that identified as Hispanic or black. So this is really those patient populations we need to be targeting. And a lot of reasons why women may not be aware is because of the atypical nature of a lot of the symptoms that they present with. So we know that when we think especially about a heart attack, normal classic symptoms are you feel like there's an elephant sitting at the center of your chest, it's not going away, or if it is going away, it's usually when you're resting or perhaps you're given a medicine called nitroglycerin, which we put under the tongue. But then there's a third of the time where women may not feel those typical symptoms. They may feel not even pain in their chest. They may feel it in their jaw, in their back, in their neck. They may feel short of breath or even sometimes tiredness or fatigue could be a red flag that there's something pending and maybe it's the heart, that fatigue that perseverates and just doesn't go away even though you're getting enough sleep. So those, it makes it a little bit complicated, not even just for the patient in the community, but even sometimes for clinicians to think more broadly. And that's why it's important that clinicians do a better job at taking a history and figuring out what one's risk factors are. It's also important that we do more research. And I include research in the reason why we're seeing that women are having higher rates, especially young women, especially women of color of disparities when it comes to heart disease. Because when we look at the inclusion of women in research studies, at best, it's about 30% of the population, which when you compare that to men, it's over 70 to 80% enrollment. So we have to do a better job in having equal 50% women, 50% men when we're looking and focusing on these research trials. I talk a lot about ethnic racial minorities and even beyond the African American race and ethnicity. We know that members of the indigenous population also have very high rates of cardiovascular disease. Um, beyond that, we know where somebody grew up, such as geography and their living environment, more people in rural communities tend to also have higher rates and poor outcomes. We also know that socioeconomic status plays a role too, because what, the lower one socioeconomic status, the greater their risk of having poor outcomes from cardiovascular events. And when we focus in on risk factors, this is really where we're gonna have an opportunity right now to hone in more on the traditional risk factors, because it's these traditional risk factors that truly do make heart disease 80% of the time preventable. When we think about the United States, we know high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and smoking is actually, those are probably the three most common risk factors that are modifiable, meaning we can change them with, of course, dedication and time, more so lifestyle. And unfortunately, about half of Americans have at least one of these three risk factors. Beyond that, we know diabetes, being overweight or obese, having a poor diet, being physically inactive or drinking an ex excess amount of alcohol are also contributing factors. And again, it's those things that make heart disease 80% of the time preventable because they are things we could modify. Those are things we could change. Those are things that we can really change when it comes to our lifestyle. The areas that we can't change are our family history. And we know it's very important for you to learn about your family history. So anybody with a first degree relative, a mother, father, or sibling or children who's a male um, earlier or younger than the age of 55 or a female younger than the age of 65 that had a form of cardiovascular disease that does place you at a heightened risk of having it yourself. Beyond that, we know that as we get older, our risk increases. So any male above the age of 45 or any female above the age of 55, that's also a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. We don't, we don't want to forget about other risk factors. Um, many times, these are risk factors that even some clinicians don't even think about. But when we think about heart disease, it is an inflammatory process. So as you could imagine, anything that increases your level of inflammation potentially could be a risk factor for heart disease. So anybody that has inflammatory bowel disease, which normally is another term for Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, Anyone that may have HIV or even psoriasis, which is a skin disorder, that can place you at a higher risk of having a future cardiovascular event. 
We also know sleep disorders, specifically sleep apnea or sleep deprivation is another common um, risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And something that I do think we need to do a better job at screening for, because it's a lot more common than we used to think in the past. Beyond that, there are risk factors that are very specific for women. And this is where we know that when it comes to traditional risk factors, we need to actually see these traditional risk factors, how, are, how is it different compared to women versus men? And when it comes to high blood pressure, it's actually more common in women as we get older. And it's also usually a stronger contributor to heart disease in women versus men. Beyond that, smoking, so again, a very common traditional risk factor. We know that if you are a female and you smoke the same amount of cigarettes for the same duration, you are actually at a 25% higher risk of having a cardiac event compared to your male counterpart who smokes the exact same duration and amount of cigarettes you do. We also know that when it comes to diabetes, this actually can increase the risk of heart disease by three to times in a female and only about two to three times in a man. So having diabetes in a woman is a much greater risk factor than compared to the male counterpart. We also know that weight factors in as we talked about, but a female who by definition is obese is at 64% greater risk of having a heart attack compared to a male who's only at about 46%. So there are disparities, even when it comes to these traditional risk factors, really focusing more on why it's so important that we screen, going to the doctor at least once a year, if not more, depending on the risk factors you have. But what about risk factors more common in women? Well, as I talked about already, heart disease is an inflammatory process. And anybody who has inflammation is gonna be at a higher risk. Other disorders that we know disproportionately affect more women than men are inflammatory rheumatologic conditions like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. This could actually increase your risk of having heart issues by 50%. Breast cancer treatment as well. As I said, one in 31 women right now are dying from breast cancer. But when we actually look at it, over 95% of women are surviving breast cancer, which is amazing. There's with the advent of all these amazing technologies and radiation therapy and chemotherapy, they're doing such a fantastic job in removing the cancer. But a lot of times those agents could be toxic to the heart and that could increase one's risk of having heart issues. So we definitely want to make sure in any of our female patients that were treated for breast cancer that they're seeing at least getting a baseline electrocardiogram, which is looking at the electricity in the heart. And based on that, determining if they need to be established with the cardiologist to do more testing, especially based on which chemotherapeutic agents they may have received. Another important thing, especially in the midst of this pandemic we're still going through, is that depression, anxiety, and chronic emotional stress, these are risk factors for heart disease, things that nobody actually thinks of, and also, unfortunately, things that people don't routinely screen for. We know that the risk is double in women versus men, and we also know that it's really specific, also, furthermore, based on one's race or ethnicity. There's a term which we have researched, which is called the strong black women schema. And what that entails is, is that the historical prevalence of the misogyny coupled with racism, having that chronic stress of both of those things potentially leads to premature heart disease. So I don't want to mitigate depression or anxiety or chronic stress. If anything, I actually work very closely with the primary care doctors to make sure that my patients are treated for it because we do know that there are usually very poor outcomes and it actually can lead to not only heart disease, but even recurrent events if they already had one. Now, beyond that, risk factors special to women include polycystic ovarian syndrome, where you have multiple cysts that form in your ovaries. Polycystic ovarian syndrome can sometimes lead to trouble conceiving, such as infertility. We also know that it can lead to something called metabolic syndrome, where you have, um, where you're slightly overweight or obese, and you may have issues with your cholesterol or triglyceride levels, or even your blood sugar, something called insulin resistance. This is a risk factor in the future for heart disease. Menopause, specifically early menopause, the earlier one goes into menopause, the higher the risk. 
Um, early menopause is defined as anybody younger than 45 years of age who went into menopause. And we know that that puts you at a 95% higher risk of a future heart attack. Beyond that, having an early menstrual period, 12 years or younger, can also increase your risk of heart disease. Hormone therapy always comes up, and we know that it's really dependent on one's risk overall. Um, in the past, we had discouraged the use of hormone therapy, and we still discourage the use in patients that have known cardiovascular disease, but we've come a long way with respect to hormone therapy where we are doing a better job at risk stratifying patients and patients that are in a lower risk group may be able to be placed on hormone therapy, not to protect them from having a heart attack, but solely to treat their symptoms like the hot flashes or any of the other symptoms that they may be receiving because they're going through menopause. Beyond that, we know that a lot of risk factors that are special to women also occur with pregnancy. So we talk about something called hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. This is when your blood pressure is very high after 20 weeks gestation. And that is a spectrum. It could range anywhere from just the mere fact your blood pressure is high to something a little bit more extreme where you have something called preeclampsia, where not only is your blood pressure high, but you're spilling a lot of proteins from the urine. It's affecting other vital organs, such as the brain, the lungs, the heart. And women that have had any of these hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are at about a three time greater risk of having a future cardiac event. We also know that preterm delivery, anyone who had a baby before 37 weeks, especially very preterm delivery before 32 weeks is another risk factor in the future for heart disease. Gestational diabetes, we always think about is gonna put you at a heightened risk for diabetes. It very well may, but it also can put you at a higher risk for a future cardiovascular event. And beyond that, having a baby small for gestational age also can potentially place you at a higher risk of having heart disease. Interestingly, fertility is another important topic. We know that one in eight women experience it. It's very common, particularly nowadays. And it's most important for us to understand that women that have failed treatment, multiple failed treatments, multiple miscarriages, those are, and or the inability to conceive can actually put you at also a higher risk in the future for heart disease, not even heart disease, but also stroke. Now, going back to our most vulnerable patient population, again, the African-American female, it's important for us to move beyond just the risk factors that we talked about, but really delve deeper into the why maybe the African-American community, especially younger women are having the highest rates when we see the number of deaths from cardiovascular disease. And we know that, yes, biology and genetics plays a role, but it's really the vast majority of the time it has a lot to do with our environments, which includes our diet, our lifestyle, but also more importantly, our socioeconomic status and our exposure and our access to certain um, things such as healthcare. These are terms called social determinants of health. And many of the biggest drivers of health are beyond the scope of healthcare. It's actually, when you look at it, 60% of the time, our health is dictated by these social determinants, which include 40% of the time, our personal behavior, or 20% of the time, our environment and social factors. So do we have access to healthy foods? Do we have access to an area where we can safely exercise and walk freely? Do we have access to a physician? who's going to be able to have that communication with us where we could have improved health literacy. And unfortunately, we know that a lot of times the answer is no in these potential vulnerable populations. We also know a lot of times that the reason why we're seeing this disparities are centered on the historical legacy of structural racism. It's at the root of it. But we also know beyond that, it has a lot to do with the inequities we're seeing and the mistrust, appropriate level of mistrust that these patient populations have to the medical community and the healthcare community in general. So it's important that we acknowledge these social determinants of health, because if you could imagine our most vulnerable patient population having any one of those traditional risk factors and maybe adding those more female specific risk factors to it, but then adding 
these other social determinants, such as lack of ability to access food or education, and of course, the discrimination that they are experiencing, that's going to lead to heightened rates of unfortunately poor outcomes in these patient populations. And this actually translates into pregnancy as well. And I bring up pregnancy because we know that in the United States, we are the only industrialized world country in the world that has the worst outcomes when it comes to death and also overall just complications with our pregnancy, not just during the pregnancy, but also the postpartum period. And we know that the leading cause of these poor outcomes is heart disease. 26.5% of pregnancy-related deaths are due to some form of cardiovascular disease. And when we focus in on the groups that have the highest rates, it's again, it's very similar to what we're seeing with car uh, cardiovascular disease. It's in the Black and Indigenous women that are three to four times more likely to die during pregnancy and the postpartum period. And we know that one thing that could be contributing to this, again, are those social determinants, as I mentioned, but it's also a missed opportunity that we're noticing where we're not identifying heart disease risk factors during the prenatal period or even during the pregnancy. We also know that barriers to preconception factor in as well. And preconception counseling is such an important part to lead and ensure that you have a healthy and uh, very well and productive pregnancy. Beyond that, we know that there are gaps in high-risk pregnancy care. So a lot of moms now are older, advanced maternal age is a factor. We also know that because they're older, they may have already underlining comorbidities and traditional risk factors, which again, focus in on the importance of this preconception period or preconception counseling. But we also know that there may be delays in recognition of cardiovascular symptoms Shortness of breath is something that definitely is very common with pregnancy, but it also is common with heart disease. So a lot of times, not only is it hard for the patient to know what is due to the baby, what's not, it's also sometimes hard for the clinician. And that's why you want to look at your most vulnerable patient populations, taking the traditional risk factors into play and making sure that you're actually screening for any underlining conditions they may see. Now, what is important is, is that we extend the follow-up of these mothers, because a third of the time, a lot of the complications we see when it comes to the heart doesn't necessarily occur during the pregnancy. It actually occurs in the postpartum period. It could actually be up to one year postpartum. So we wanna make sure that we extend that follow-up up to one year. About a third of the time, as I mentioned, that's when we're seeing these complications. And it's also important as clinicians for us, and if you are a patient out there that's pregnant and have had any concerns or any of those risk factors that we talked about, it's important that you let your doctor know when your last pregnancy was, not necessarily when your last menstrual period was, but when your last pregnancy was. Because if it's within a year, it's very possible that the symptoms you're feeling, which may be concerning, could, could be coming from your heart, could be related still to the pregnancy that you had. Now, what I can say is that in our field, cardiology, we've made, we've had long strides because now we know the importance of collaboration and we focus so much on maternal heart health because again, it's that younger population where we're seeing these disparities in care, the higher rates of death. And these are the women that are, we're seeing them mainly during their pregnancy. So we have an opportunity now to actually form a team where we have cardiologists working with obstetricians, working with primary doctors, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that we take care of the female across the whole spectrum of her health, pre-pregnancy, during pregnancy, and then after pregnancy. And then making sure that we continue to follow them into their older age to ensure that any of the issues that they may have experienced with their pregnancy or any of those other risk factors we talked about are very well cared for and looked into. Now, I bring up the importance of this slide, which I know looks very technical, but more so to highlight the fact that all of the risk factors I brought up, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, those traditional risk factors like blood pressure issues, obesity, high cholesterol, but even those more female specific risk factors beyond polycystic ovarian syndrome, such as those that occur during pregnancy, like your gestational high blood pressure or diabetes, 
all of those risk factors are things that are unfortunately attacking our arterial wall. And this here is a cross section of an artery where you can see, um, at least on the left hand side, it's a normal artery. I say it's normal because there's no plaque or disease. Move over to the right hand side, you can actually see that with time, if we don't do something about those other risk factors with time, that artery no longer will look normal. It's going to get bigger and bigger, and it's unfortunately going to become more and more disease. So really what we want to do right now, knowing that cardiovascular disease is something preventable 80% of the time, and furthermore, knowing that complications with pregnancy is preventable 60% of the time, we want to focus in on the left part of this graph to make sure that we identify these risk factors, the non-traditional ones, but also really strongly manage those traditional risk factors to make sure that our arteries all look like the normal artery on the left and never look like that abnormal artery on the right. So it's very important. And this is where prevention comes into play. And this is something that the American Heart Association has helped us with, where they know that based on this graph here, um, on the X axis, it's the number of ideal health behaviors. And on the right axis, it's by age, sex, and race, basically the incidence adjusted. When you increase the number of ideal or optimal risk factors, you have a lower proportion of people who have heart disease. And when you think about the number of ideal health behaviors, the American Heart Association created something which was what they thought to be simple. That's why they called it Life Simple 7 where they focus in on what are the seven tools to help you ensure that you prevent yourself from getting cardiovascular disease. And what are those seven? So staying active. We know that exercising at least 150 minutes per week of some form of cardio, which could be briskly walking, is so important. We also know controlling your, your blood cholesterol. That could be through lifestyles such as eating healthy, exercising, Sometimes that may be through medication, and that's where talking to your provider, your clinician is going to be important. We know eating a healthy diet, which is usually more plant predominant, is better. We know that managing blood pressure is also part of this, making sure that you're not even in that borderline elevation in blood pressure, but even furthermore, when it comes to blood sugar, you're not in that pre-diabetes or borderline state. If you're overweight, losing weight, and again, all of that could be through healthy lifestyle, eating healthy, exercising well, and most importantly, not smoking, especially as a female, again, knowing that we're at a 25% greater risk of having worse complications than our male colleagues. In addition, I like to include kind of a life simple eight, where stress management and mental wellness is a part of it. As I said, Chronic anxiety, stress, depression, these are all risk factors for unfortunately cardiovascular events. So it's important that we think about ways to actually have a healthy way of dealing with our stress. We don't want our stress to take over our life. We don't want it to per be perseverating because that's when complications could arouse, arise. So we have to make sure that stress management is a part of this. Beyond that, really, I think for you and ending the next few slides here is to figure out, well, doctor, what should I do? What should the approach be? And I like to use this graphic because I really do think that our health needs to start even when we're babies, definitely when we're children, and more importantly, as young as we can, because that will dictate what our future health will look like and the longevity and wellness of our health. So it's really across the spectrum of a female. And this is, I think, a great graphic because it talks about, again, figuring out, do I have any of those risk factors that Dr. Bond brought up today? I, I understand the traditional risk factors, but what about the complications with pregnancy? What about hormones? What about the possibility of me having breast cancer and I was treated for it? If I have any of these, speaking with your doctor and asking, well, what are my traditional risk factors? What do they look like? What does my blood pressure look like? Is it ideal? What does my cholesterol look like? Is that ideal? What does my blood sugar look like? Is that ideal? Is my weight ideal? Should I be exercising more? Making sure you follow the path of Life Simple 7. And more importantly, thinking about asking if your if you're, uh, personal doctor, your primary doctor isn't thinking about it, asking, well, should I see a cardiologist?
Should I see a specialist who focuses in on prevention, especially if I have any of the abnormalities that we discussed? This is, I think, an overall approach, and it's really been helpful for the majority of the population. And with that, I'm going to stop speaking and open it up for any questions that you have for me. Sure. Is um, I don't didn't know if Lee wanted to speak first. Andrea, what do you? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was having trouble getting control back of my mouth. I was like, what's happening? That's okay. So That's yeah, okay. I, I wanted to give you the floor. Uh, we'd love to hear your story, um, a little bit about your journey. And if you have any questions for Dr. Bond before we open it up. Sure. Actually, I do have a question for Dr. Bond. Um, I love how you termed the Life Simple 7, I like how you turned that into Life Simple 8 and you incorporated stress as a factor because I think that definitely played a role in my, my heart journey. But um, my question for you is, you know, sometimes men and women deal with stress differently. In your um, opinion, how do you think that plays into the fact that women's heart disease is so much higher? Oh, absolutely. So I think that's a really important differentiator that you're bringing up. So not only are women more prone to having higher rates of chronic stress, anxiety, and depression, but we're also more likely to not necessarily work and manage them in a healthy way, right? So we as women always put ourselves usually well below the, that of others, especially our family members, even sometimes our colleagues. And that is where we need to stop because we have to say, okay, if I'm dealing with a situation, especially if I've had an underlying heart issue or stroke or some form of cardiovascular disease, I need to make sure that I'm taking my feelings and my mental wellness extremely seriously. In order for me to do that, I have to put myself first. I need to make sure that I'm healthy so that way my family could be healthy, that way my colleagues could be healthy, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to make sure you put yourself first. But to answer your question, we know that there are differences in terms of how one manages and copes with stress. And that's why it's important to also reach out to your healthcare provider, because we, are, we need to be there for you to help you figure out the better ways to manage it, if that is through group support, um, individual support, maybe exercise, doing meditation, yoga, things that I definitely do encourage and we know has been scientifically proven to not just help with anxiety and stress, but also lowering blood pressure and even cholesterol. Those are things that where your clinician may be able to help you. Thank you. And, and I can completely relate to that. Um, just to share a little bit about my story, um, I was born with a heart defect but I didn't know that I had a heart defect, defect until I was well into adulthood. Um, throughout my heart journey though, I've learned a lot about congenital heart defects. I've learned a lot about cardiovascular disease in general, especially for seminars like this. And thank you again, Dr. Bond, I learned a lot. Um, but during my heart journey, I also learned a lot about myself and how to create that balance in my life. And it can completely relate to your, your topic about the, the stress that women um, have. And I had to learn how to prioritize my health. When I was younger, <clears throat> I lived my life on overdrive. I was a single mom. I was a workaholic. I was that person that got up many hours before the sun came up. And I would cram as many tasks as I could into the day. And then I would just collapse into bed at night and wake up the next day and do the same thing all over again. And that's really not a sustainable way, way to live. Uh, I'll share a brief story. When my daughter was young, we went to Target. She, Sam was probably in elementary school, little girl. And we went to Target and in my typical fashion, I'm running through the store, grabbing things that we need. And um, poor little Sam is running just as fast as her little legs will carry her behind me. And all of a sudden she stopped and she said, mom. And I turned around and I looked at her and she said, mom, what is your hurry? And at that very moment, I just stood there and stared at her. And I realized that we didn't have anywhere to be. Target wasn't closing. I, I didn't have any deadlines. This was just how I lived my life, 90 to nothing. 
And I realized that I just couldn't stay on the proverbial hamster wheel and just keep running at that same rate. And I also thought, what am I teaching my daughter by, by um, running through life without taking a moment's breath? Um, so that's when I realized that I really needed to take stop. I needed to stop. I needed to take a deep breath. I was completely exhausted and run down. I hadn't been to the doctor in a number of years. And so I figured I really needed to, um, to get my health in order. So I went to the doctor and thank goodness I did, because that's when I learned that I had a heart murmur. Um, of course, my, my primary doctor um, referred me to a cardiologist, um, and I won't go through all of the story of all the testing and everything I went, but I was eventually diagnosed with something called aortic stenosis, which Dr. Bond referred to, and that's a narrowing or tightening of your aortic valve. My condition was not severe, and the doctor said, we'll just monitor it, but it was a wake-up call for me. And I knew that, I mean, I had a young daughter to raise. I had heart disease and I had a young daughter to raise. So I really needed to prioritize my health. And I did the things that, that you're supposed to do. I made some lifestyle changes. I joined a gym, I paid attention to my diet and I really worked hard at creating balance in my life and managing that stress. And I think I did a pretty good job. Um, fast forward a number of years, uh, Sam went off to college, um, I got remarried, uh, my husband's daughter started her family and we were blessed with two little granddaughters. Um, but all along, it was important for me to keep going to the cardiologist. So I never missed an appointment. I went every six months and life was good uh, until the fateful day where I went to my cardiologist and I heard the magic words. And those magic words were, my dear, it's time for your heart surgery. And, you know, it, that, that threw me right back into a sense of panic and a sense of a loss of control. Um, it wasn't really a decision that I needed to make um, because if I didn't have the, the heart surgery, I wasn't going to live another year. So it really wasn't up to, the stress wasn't making a decision about the, the heart surgery. The stress was what's gonna happen? Um, what's, gonna, what's gonna change in my life? What if something goes wrong? What if I don't make it? I was in the midst of a major project at work with a, a big new client. And all I could think is who's gonna take over this project? And, and then my mind just started racing. Uh, who's gonna host all of those holiday meals? Who's gonna bake the birthday cakes? Who's gonna help Sam plan her wedding when the time comes if, if I'm not here? Fortunately, um, I gave myself a couple of weeks before my surgery. And in those couple of weeks, I again had another moment of clarity. And it, it, it dawned on me that the company that I worked for, they weren't gonna fold if I wasn't there. The project was gonna continue with someone else leading it. Um, and, and the most important thing was I learned that the people that are around me, they were very smart and very capable and very independent. And so while my family and the people that I loved would be sad if something happened to me, I knew that they would be okay. Um, and, and that was a blessing. It was a blessing to know that going into surgery, that if something did happen, that they would be okay. And I was thankful that I had, had come to that realization. My surgery was an aortic valve replacement and I had an aortic uh, aneurysm repair. And for those of you, luckily I did really well. Um, my surgery went well, I was very fortunate, um, but as people on the call may know, um, if you've had open heart surgery, any, any surgery really, any major surgery, you know that when you come home, you need help. And um, Dr. Bond kind of, <laughs> uh, touched on this as well, that we as women, we're used to being the helper and it is very difficult for us sometimes to accept help. And so that's a lesson I learned in my heart journey during my recovery after open heart surgery that I needed to let other people help me. Um, and, I, and I had to, it wasn't really an option. Um, I couldn't lift anything. Um, I was on pain medication. I couldn't drive anywhere. So I really had to rely on the people around me to, to help me. Um, and, you know, in closing, I think about women and how, how easily I fell into the trap as a young woman of thinking that I had to do it all and I had to do it all perfectly. Um, 
And, and that, that's sort of um, mindset. It's just not sustainable. It's not healthy. Um, I, I was forced into, into accepting the fact that I had heart disease, that I had to make adjustments in my, in my, um, my, in my health, um, and I had to prioritize myself. And I realized that we owe it to not only ourselves, but the people that we love to take care of ourselves and to put that pressure first. You know, I think it's kind of a, uh, a weird saying, but it's, I think there's some truth in it when they say, if the oxygen mask falls, put yourself, put yours on first before you help others. And it's, you know, kind of maybe overused, but it, it's true that you do have to take care of yourself in order to help others. Um, for those of you out there that are running on overdrive, um, my advice would be, you need to, to recognize that you need to find the pressure valve and you need to find a way to release that tension. Um, Dr. Bond said a few different things. If you're into yoga or you're into Tai Chi, whatever it is that, that helps you release that tension, you need to find an activity. For me, it's walking. Um, after open heart surgery, they get you up walking the very next day. I have walked every single day uh, for five years, over five years now, um, because it's a commitment I made to myself. It's good for my health. It also clears my mind. It takes that, it, it's, it's my pressure valve, valve, no pun intended. It's my pressure valve. I can connect with nature. I connect spiritually. I clear my mind. Whatever it is that helps you reconnect with yourself, um, I, I, I recommend to people on the call to, to find that. Life has stressors. You can't, you, can't, you can't prevent things. I can't help that I was born with a heart defect, but I do have control over how I react to, to that knowledge. And I try today to recognize what life's priorities are. I try to let go of perfectionism. Um, I realize now that my family cares a lot less about what my Thanksgiving tablescape looks like and more about the fact that I'm sitting there at the Thanksgiving table with them. So um, find a way to prioritize your health. Remember things don't have to be perfect, that stressors are gonna happen, but recognize them and, and try to manage them. And thanks, that's my story. That's so great, thank you so much. And I just would like to say, you need to teach a class for women <laughs> me who really just, I recognize the fact that we need to slow down and not take on so much, but it's really hard, really hard. So you could teach a class for us. <laughs> I um, would like to go ahead and we are going to take our final polls while I give the last call for any questions that you would like to have answered by either Dr. Bond or by Lee. And um, if you have the question, put them in the question and answer box. But and before we get to the questions, I would like to re-check your knowledge. Do you feel much more knowledgeable now than you did at the beginning of the webinar on your level of risk as a woman for heart disease and stroke? And it, it, the, the talk was fascinating to me um, because I didn't realize that there was so many things that could be considered a risk factor um, in the lives of a woman. And so I think that I learned a lot, so I appreciate that. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. And we've got 93% of everybody says that now says they're knowledgeable. So that is great. We definitely did that well. Um, finally, I'm just going to launch one last poll. I'm going to keep the audience on their toes. Um, based on your participation at the webinar, we love to get your feedback because this is how we get better at what we do and the information that we send to you, um, out and, and educational programs that we create are hopefully meaningful and impactful. And we'd like to know um, if we're doing our job. So thank you for doing that. And then Mandy, I'm gonna turn it over to you to ask the question. Yes, so Dr. Bond, we've got a couple of questions for you. 
Bonnie asks, does taking hormone blockers under the age of 40 add any risks for heart disease if there is a family history? Yeah, so I'm presuming when you say hormone blockers, you're referring to maybe hormone therapy, which would make me believe that if you're under the age of 40, as we discussed, that would be premature menopause or at least early signs of that. Now, we have, as I did allude to during my talk, we've come a long way with hormone therapy right now where we, we do know that within a year of you starting menopause, placing a patient as soon as possible on hormone therapy could actually be beneficial. That being said, we do need to factor in what their overall risks include. So somebody who has a family history of heart disease, we may want to make sure that we're looking at those other risk factors, such as their blood pressure, cholesterol, their blood sugar, or their weight, if they're exercising, et cetera, and factoring all that in. And if the risk still remains low, it's absolutely reasonable to start the hormone therapy, again, not to protect you from having heart disease or stroke, because we know that we never place patients on hormone therapy for that but to help you with the symptoms of those hot flashes and other things that you may be experiencing. One thing I do wanna stress is that we never encourage women be remaining on hormone therapy more than 10 years, especially if the hormone therapy is going to be extended beyond the time you would naturally experience menopause. Because it's then as we get older, when we begin to start to feel that we are at a higher risk of having complications such as stroke and issues with the heart. So it's a really, it's important conversation. Every patient is different. And that's why you wanna be very thoughtful when you talk to your clinicians about the use of hormone therapy. And if they don't feel comfortable, you can definitely ask them, well, should we get the involvement as somebody else knowing that I have a few risk factors, I have a family history, would it be reasonable for me to see a heart specialist so we can figure out if this is a appropriate management plan for myself? Thank you. And she did follow up and say a hormone blocker, like, um, I hope I don't mispronounce this, tamo oh. tamoxifen. Got it. So tamoxifen is for cancer. Yeah. So for breast cancer. So it's a routine uh, hormone blocker that we use for breast cancer. Now to answer your question under the age of 40, any risk for heart disease, if there is a family history. So we know that tamoxifen has not been shown to per se place you at a higher risk for a future heart event, but usually the more standard agents that we use during um, chemotherapy, specifically for breast cancer, something which would be called adriamycin. We also know another term is Herceptin as an example. Those can commonly sometimes unfortunately lead to issues around the heart. And these are things we wanna identify, not even in the future, but during the time you're getting treatment. So a lot of times the oncologist may determine or refer you out to see a heart specialist where we can do imaging of your heart, doing an ultrasound of the heart, for example, to make sure that the muscle squeezing really well, the muscle being the heart. Beyond that though, if you've had any form of treatment for the breast cancer, it would be important for you to talk to your clinician to determine if any of the treatment, especially if it's radiation therapy, which we do know, places you at a future risk for heart disease, but if any of the chemotherapeutic agents or the hormone therapy that you're on also places you at a future risk, it would be very reasonable for you to see a heart specialist just to get a baseline, especially if you have a family history as well. I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, how does a lack of a traditional family structure, and I think probably we're seeing this more and more as time goes on, so more single moms, uh, how does that impact the black, uh, black women's schema, the, what you were talking about before? Yeah, I mean, I think it affects just the all of women's schema, not necessarily just focusing in on the African American community. We know that data has shown that single mothers in particular have higher rates of premature disease, be it blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, um, heart disease. Again, all of these are risk factors in the future for heart disease. So it's important that we do acknowledge that. And that's why as clinicians, we wanna know about the structure at home. Um, the, I think for me, um, this 
pandemic has really opened my eyes to really how my patients are living because I'm doing a lot more of telehealth and telemedicine visits. So I could actually see their, their home environment. I can see who's in their home and all of that factors into one's care. If you're a single mother, maybe you don't have as much of the support as you're used to as perhaps somebody who has a partner who can help them. So we have to think about that. And it's really important for me as a doctor and your physicians to also ask these questions. If they're not asking them, you need to tell us because I do think that, that all of that can factor in in the future into are you at a little bit of a higher risk of having complications versus somebody who uh, doesn't because they have that support, that social support that maybe you're lacking. But it isn't also important to realize that we get social support even beyond having a partner. Um, and that's where understanding the environment and where they're living factors in. But I do think that for the most part, mothers that are single, irrespective of their race or ethnicity, are definitely at a higher risk of having premature disease because of the stresses you could imagine that comes with that. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you all so very much. Um, before we end, I just want to make a note for everyone watching. Um, the session six, which is the final session of the series, um, is on May 5th, which does not follow our normal, typical every Tuesday thing. So I just want to point that out. It's on May 5th at three o'clock, and that is the lipid myth busters, the dietary su supplements and cardiovascular risk. Um, so please, if you haven't uh, registered for that, we will send out this information and the PDF of the slides after the event. And I just would like to thank our sponsors again um, for allowing this to be possible for the series of education. Dr. Bond and Lee Parker, thank you both so much for being here. We appreciate it. And for everyone watching, thank you again for joining us and we will talk to you soon. Bye.